Hey everyone, welcome back. This is Michelle with Paladin Global Markets Online Business Podcast. I am so excited. I have another amazing guest for you today, Alex Oliveira. You are not going to want to miss this show. So Alex is also has his own podcast called Dadpreneur, but I wanted to just share with you the wealth of information he's going to bring to us today. You guys are going to absolutely enjoy having him as our guest. So Alex has always brought his A game with energy. He's generated over 30 million in leads for over 3,000 SMBs and many Fortune 500s like Ford, Allstate, and many others. His expertise is in the digital marketing space, and that has allowed him to teach an MBA program at FAU. And he's trained marketing directors at global corporations. He's managed thousands of campaigns across social media, search engines, email, and many others. He brings powerful tips on what's new and what works to generate more leads and grow your business. You guys are not going to want to miss this interview. Alex also has a special free gift that I'm going to have available to you at the end of this show, and I'll have links in the description and the show notes as well. So without further ado, let's get started with our interview. Welcome to Paladin Global Markets Online Business Podcast. I am so excited today to have our special guest, Alex Oliveira. He is um, going to bring a wealth of wisdom to our show. I know you guys are going to really enjoy him. Welcome to the show, Alex. Oh, thank you, Michelle. I, pre I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Can you tell our audience a little bit about your business and, and how you got started in this type of business? Sure. So... You know, my entrepreneur journey really started when I was about 11 years old. My first job, I actually have pictures of me busting tables in 1989. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, when my family and I, we came from Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, immigrated here for a better opportunity. You know, family in Brazil, you know, at that time, the country was going through a lot of turmoil yeah. and we just needed to go to a place where there were better opportunities. And we came here. So the typical immigrant story, entrepreneurial, we came here, my mom and dad started their own business. And what was great about it is that I learned early on how to do all those things, go to the yeah. flea market with them. They used to sell shirts Love in it. the flea market. And I learned how to sell. I learned how to fold shirts. I learned how to go to the factory with them, place orders. And at that time, they didn't speak the language. So my sister and I were the ones who used to translate for them, right? right? So early on, I was always wanting to make money. That was my thing because, you know, they, they're they here in the country, don't speak English. They've got to put food on the table. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'll do newspaper deliveries. I worked busing tables. I worked with them. And I got that bug of right. like, oh, I can make money. I can sell, I can market. Right. And pretty much through high school and college, it was just always there. Even though I had jobs, mm -hmm. worked at the credit union in Orlando. I was telling you when yeah. I went to college in Orlando. So I worked at the Fairwinds credit union for a year, but again, found that corporate really wasn't for me. Um, I, then I became a stockbroker for about a year, found cool. that that wasn't for me either. Right. And then about 2002 came down to South Florida and joined the family business. And, and that's it. And then from there on, I've had many businesses in different industries, uh, like the construction industry, mm -hmm. uh, real estate. But for the last 10 years, I have focused solely on digital marketing and online lead gen. Love it. As, as, yeah. As things were growing, it was like, okay, I see where digital is going and it's mm -hmm. paid off. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. And that's one of the main reasons I wanted to bring you on the show. I know our audience is absolutely going to love it as an online business podcast. Are there, I'd love to dive into some of the tips that you can share with our audience with small businesses who are trying to get the, has that entrepreneur spirit like you and I do, has, saw the, the, the profit, the potential that's um, to be made out there and to harness the power of the internet and online businesses. Can you give us some tips and tricks for that? Absolutely. It's one of those things that I think you go into it first as an entrepreneur and no matter whether you're selling online or offline it, and you, you learn as you go that patience, right? Patience is like the, the thing that none of us have as entrepreneurs. You just want to start, go and sell. Yeah. And the thing is you got to be consistent online. Yeah. And that's like the main thing, being consistent. So whether you're doing SEO, whether you're doing pay-per-click, social media marketing on Amazon, on eBay, wherever you are, you will notice that there is a, a, an element there 
-hmm. from the people that succeed, the variable, the main variable is they are consistent. They stick with it. It's not, I'm sure you're not going to tell your clients, the people you train, Hey, you're going to start on eBay and a month from today, you're just going to be like selling like crazy. No, heck no. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't work that way. So yeah, it takes time. A lot of testing. Mm -hmm. You can't give up. And I think that that's just a, a something that entrepreneurs have to really get used to, to begin with. And yeah. the fact that you start a new, a new company or, or even within the same company, I've seen many pivot during uh, the pandemic uh, yeah. and you just have to be forgiving to yourself that like, look, I'm taking a risk. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change my business model, my target audience, right. the different channels. I got to invest time and money here mm -hmm. and then get some good people to work with me, create a team. But the thing that, that I think holds that all together that yeah. brings it all together is the consistency. You know, I always use the analogy with my kids of exercising. Now I'm not like a big gym guy, but I run a lot and yeah. I, I, I play basketball and all of that. And what I notice is to sh stay in shape. It's just the consistency. Yeah. If I fall off the horse for a month, I feel it in my pants, right? I'm like, yes. whoa, they're, they're what, the first what? thing to tell. Yeah. And I don't even have to go crazy eating but just even eating normal and no exercise, I already feel the difference. So marketing and digital and online, whether you're doing e-commerce or, or, or just services, it's mm -hmm. the same. You, you can't do it for three months or four months or just Monday through Friday. It's for, it's a forever thing. Yeah. And, and the, the thing that I tell business owners is like your, your accounting. And I say accounting because I sucked at accounting for a long time. I leaned on my bookkeepers and my CPA mm -hmm. to do everything. And I'm like, I, I just want to know we're profitable, yeah, right? Yeah. My, my, early on, early on in 2000s, that's what I would do. And I made a lot of mistakes because of that, yeah. right? And it was my CPA who's been with me for 15 years now that said, Alex, you have to care about your profit and loss. You have to care about the financials. Mm -hmm. So I made it my business to really get good at balance sheets right. and, and look at that every day. So Mark. the same goes for your digital marketing and online business. As you know, Michelle, is that you have to be analyzing it, measuring daily. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's just a quick, quick peek, right. just look at the report and say, okay, nothing happened here. Uh, maybe it's been a month. Let me turn that off and then move on to this. Exactly. It's like this again, like exercise. So that's, that's my biggest tip is to be consistent and stick with it. Don't ever think that you can just start. And then, and then even when you have success that you pull back and say, okay, now I've invested right. time and money into SEO or social media. Right. Now let me just stop. It doesn't work right. that way. No, not at all. You know, I think that is very wise. And, and for our audience listening as well, I think that's the biggest thing I have learned over the years. Because when you first get started in the entrepreneur journey, you think, okay, well, it's, uh, I need to learn this big thing. Or if I just find this one tweet, then that's just going to make it. But really, when you look and you pull behind the curtains and you look at successful entrepreneurs over the journey of a lifetime, you see it's the day in and day out consistency. It really is those simple, measurable, consistent steps that really pay off. And the ones that stick with it are usually the ones that will continue to see success in most industries, for sure. And today, to your point, most consumers, almost all of us, we're, we're constantly looking at our smartphones. Right. Everything you do, you need a, a, a new water heater, a new tires, a dentist. You go here. This is where you go. Right. And so I always ask people, I mean, we're not asking our neighbors anymore, our coworkers. You're doing your own research, looking at the reviews, mm -hmm. and you feel empowered. And so by the time your customer gets to you right. or to your website or to your page on eBay or Amazon, they already know what they want. Yeah, good point. They, they, they already know. You don't have to educate them, right? I hear this from doctors because we work with med medical practices and we work with law firms. So two services that are pretty complicated, right? Yeah. Most of us are not lawyers, then you, you think like, but it takes you 10 minutes online, you, even if you're looking at something that's not super accurate or reliable, yeah. right. to be educated on a specific subject matter. Let's, let's take social security disability. We work mm -hmm. with a law firm that does SSD. We hear the calls because the calls are recorded, the leads right. come in and you hear their intake people talk about, you know, social security disability. And by the time they talk to the, to the paralegal, they already know what the rules from social security administration is. Wow. They're just really trying to figure out what is your fee? 
How are you going to do it? And how are you different? So you, you can't lead with like, you know, I, I see a lot with many businesses that are service. Mm -hmm. They, they don't want to put the work into creating content yeah. like resources, eBooks, videos. And I say you have to, because if you don't educate your target audience, your mm -hmm. competitors will. I love that. That's such a great point. It really is. And, and, and consumers are more educated than ever before. You're absolutely right. I think that's, that's really wise for us to know when we're, we're doing our marketing efforts. Knowing that, what are some tips that you would recommend in addition to um, businesses making videos and educating their clients? So I'm a big fan of, have always been of what I refer to as own media and most digital marketers we look at four different buckets, but okay. really the main ones being paid media, shared media, and own media. Now, okay. shared media, as you could imagine, is all social media, right? Influencer mm -hmm. and things like that. Paid media is very simple. Paid ads on Facebook, paid ads on Google, right? Google ads, pay-per-click. Right. And then you've got owned. Owned are the digital properties that you own and you control 100%, which really come down to two platforms. It's your website, and it's your email marketing. Those are the only two communication channels. Now, if you have an app, great. But for most small businesses, you're not going to have an app. Right. Unless you have thousands of customers that need to log on. Um, but it's your website and your email marketing. And one is communication and the other one is the store. So I am a huge fan of building your website. Mm -hmm. You control the narrative. You control how you sell your products. And even if you're going to need to be on eBay or Amazon or Shopify, that's, that's okay. You go on different platforms, but ultimately I want to get people back to my website. Right. Now for, for, for people selling products online, like e-commerce, and I have many of those clients, I get it. eBay and Amazon are going to be always their number right. one thing. Right. Cause Amazon is giving you that platform of mm -hmm. billions of people buying. So I'm not disagreeing with that. What I am saying is that if you're building ancillary products like courses and mm -hmm. things like that, you want to do it on your website because it's better for your end user right. in so many ways. There's less friction. Mm -hmm. That communication back and forth is not controlled by an algorithm. Smart. Yep. Very, and, and with one change of the algorithm, I know you and I both have probably experienced that it can, you, you just have to pivot very quickly. Cause you're like, Oh goodness. Okay. I know my <laughs> YouTubes, my ads, my video ads, they've changed something. Um, Facebook does it all the time where you're just like, ah, oh, dang it. You have to do a little different on their platform, but when it's on your own platform, you can control it. What are some ways? I love that because that is going to build our business for, for, the lifetime, a, a good, stable, sustainable business. What are some ways that we can drive traffic to our website? So, you know, long-term is SEO. Mm -hmm. Nothing is going to beat SEO search engine optimization, but it, it, a lot of people feel like nervous about SEO because if they've done it and it didn't work, which is the case for a lot of people, yeah. a lot of business owners, then they say, oh, you know what? This SEO thing is a myth. It's not real. Mm -hmm. Google manipulates the algorithm. They're changing it two, 300 times a year. And I, I fixed the speed. I added the meta tags and right. I anchor text and the links and I build links right. and it's still not working. Right? right. And, and the thing is that first and foremost, you have to have someone who's very technical and understand how to optimize. Mm -hmm. Second of all, you have to consistently build quality content. I can attest to the AI of all the different search engines. I can attest to many tests that we've done. Mm -hmm. Quality of the content is key. So when I see people going on Fiverr and buying a blog for $10 and hoping that that blog is going to somehow get them to rank, it's right. not. You're not going to drive traffic that way. You know, you know your product best. So mm -hmm. hire a copywriter if you're not a writer yourself. And, you know, there are platforms like Text Broker is one of them that mm -hmm. we use. It's great. You can pick the level of writer, Upwork. Uh, I'm sure your yeah, audience knows about one. Upwork. And it's great. And you can pick different levels. And that blog might cost you, you know, for a 500 word blog, $30, $40, $50. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm going to write the blogs. At the end, I'm going to have a call to action with sure. an offer. And I want to drive traffic and leads there. Right. But but you you have to consistently create content and build that website. Think of it like, you have a store, a physical store at the mall. So right. Michelle just opened up a store. 
and you start with five pages. And in the case of a store, physical stores, let's say you have five displays and the rest of the store is empty. What's the likelihood that I walk past your store at the mall and I'm impressed with a half empty store? Right, exactly. It's very likely. You're not interested. I'm, I'm not interested. I'm going to say, well, that's nice. They're, they're pretty new. So I come back next week and I see 10 and then 20 and then 100. And then before you know it, I get in there and then comes the site map and the user journey. And as you start to optimize your website for a better experience, right. and you don't have to be an expert in this area. You just have to be an internet user. Pay close attention to how eBay and Amazon and Google and Facebook Mark. do their interfaces. Yeah, good tip. It's, it's simple and easy. I, I always tell people, think about Google. Right. The biggest tech company worth billions of dollars, and they've grown on one simple concept, a search bar. Interesting. That's a powerful point. You're right. How, how, okay, so like since we started using Google back in whatever it was, 97, 98, right. their homepage looks the same. It's a search bar. That's true. Good point. Has, ne has never changed. So when I look at businesses who say, oh, I want to make my website interactive and I want to gamify it and I want to spend all, I'm like, you're complicating the process. Yeah. Talk to your users and find out how they want to shop. And now for e-commerce, Shopify, in my opinion, is the best. Okay. Now, of course, there's Wix, there's Squared Space, and I'm not here to endorse one or the other. But in my experience, for people who are selling products online and then pushing it to uh, either their eBay store or Amazon store, Shopify is great because they have all the applications that integrate with other apps okay. to allow you to optimize the website in a way that the store is going to look like, wow, it, you, you know, you can compare it to, let's say... Um, a high-end store like a, a Louis Vuitton or something like that, or a, a Chewy.com where you're, you're saying, look at this pet store. Mm -hmm. It's got a really cool user experience, easy to buy. And you're a little pet store here locally. You could have a website that looks very similar Great point. to Chewy. Right. And then now the payments got to be easy, the flow, you know, and, and it's, it's just really about that. So I always tell businesses, small businesses, especially mm -hmm. think of your website a lot like a brick and mortar. How would you set up that store and how would you keep up with it? And I always make also the point that you wouldn't set it up and never change it. True. Very true. Thank you for If you go to any downtown and you look at the boutiques, what we as consumers like to see is the changes of season. I go mm -hmm. to that window and, oh, it's a new dress. Right. Oh, it's a new display. You go to Target whether it's Halloween or Easter, they're changing the displays. Why? Because we as consumers don't want to see the same static thing all mm -hmm. the time. We want it to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Absolutely love that. You know, it's on my to-do list as well. I'm like, ah, because you you focus on as an online um, business entrepreneur, you're always looking at, I'm, I'm looking at my outreach and my funnels and my podcast and YouTube and different ways to continue to get the word out there to my ideal clients so I can serve them best and see if there's something I can help provide for them as well. But it's the website that kind of, you know, it's like, well, here's my landing page, but you don't want it. You want it to be way more than a landing page. So this encourages me. I need to go ahead and get back on that website task, so to say. Are there some things that as a digital marketer that you would recommend for your website, a flow? Yeah, I mean, definitely. You just said landing page. First and foremost, whether you are, you know, building a five page or a hundred page website, in yeah. addition to the website, you need really conversion optimized landing pages. What does that mean? A landing page that is meant to sell products, yeah. is meant to generate leads, is not going to be the full website. So let's say your website, you have five, six menu buttons at the top mm -hmm. on the header. Right. The landing page is not gonna have those buttons there because the purpose of the landing page is to convert that user or visitor into a lead or a sale. And to do that, you have to, minimize the distractions yeah right it's like simple. a yeah it's like a casino you know you've ever gone on like a traditional media website like a yeah. local tv channel or newspaper right it's nuts it's I mean, crazy things are it's, all coming at you yeah and it, yes. it's like you get lost and you don't know what you're doing mm -hmm. um but for businesses it's different because you're not writing content clickbait you're mm -hmm. selling products you're generating leads that landing page needs to at, at most have your logo 
mm-hmm. on the header, a phone number, okay, maybe a search bar, right. and then go right into your headline with a call to action and then the form or your mm-hmm. product right there on the right, maybe a video or a, a, a picture image. And if you do a video, by the way, don't embed the YouTube embeddable video into okay. landing pages. What should we do? Yeah, you should use a service, uh, a video hosting service like a Vimeo. Okay. And and the reason for that, Michelle, is as you know, I'm I'm a fan of YouTube. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I I have to be honest. Uh, uh, unless you have the paid service mm-hmm. for YouTube as a consumer or user, YouTube Red, right? The user experience, quite frankly, sucks, mm-hmm. and it has always sucked. Yeah. It you know I'm here watching Michelle's video about mm-hmm. eBay. And on the right, I've got eight other videos about nonsense. Taking you away, <clears throat> taking the buyer or the, the viewer's uh, attention away from the focus. So completely opposite to what you were saying for a landing page. Co- for, correct. You're on the landing yeah. page. I don't want to see embedded videos because inevitably people will go to Candyland by clicking <laughs> to YouTube and then they're yeah. on YouTube. Next thing awesome. you know, they're watching cat videos and, <laughs> and, yes. and you're going, oh, wh- how come it. I get... Yeah. And how come I get all these clicks to my landing page, but they don't convert? Interesting. Social media links. So Mm -hmm. while I do social media marketing to generate leads, I don't put social media links or icons on my landing pages. Why? Because people are reminded to go to social media. And once they go to social media, that's the playground of the internet. They're not going to buy anything. Right. They're going to talk about whatever issue they feel like talking about. Great point. Yep. So the landing page has got to be simple. It's think of it like a flyer. And I always compare it to going to a trade show. I do a lot of conference going, not since COVID, but I'm hoping to yeah. get back into it again. Yes. And, and when we exhibit it and had booths, it's you have your full brochure of all the products that we sell. Right. Right. So like a, like a deck, but like a really nice glossy brochure. Then we have sales flyers that are just, just specifically about one solution. Mm-hmm. When someone approaches my booth and I, and let's say I'm talking to Michelle, Michelle's like, and I'm saying, Michelle, what's your pain point? You're saying, well, my pain point is really like, I have a tough time generating leads. Mm -hmm. Okay. Leads is not the same thing as SEO and the same thing as website development or content. So instead of giving you a full brochure, you just told me that you're interested in leads. I'm going to get the brochure about leads smart, and only talk about the lead offer for you. Right. Same thing with your landing page. The landing page is your sales flyer. Mm-hmm. So focus on one product. Now, if you have a hundred products, have a hundred landing pages okay. and optimize them as such. Now they can use the same theme and template. Uh-huh. You're just changing the words, the offer, the call to action, the price, the okay. description. Um, but you will notice a shift in the conversion of your leads and sales when you optimize it that way. You keep blinders on. You're basically keeping the focus. Because I think buyers nowadays, I know they are, that they are more distracted than ever. They have a less attention span than ever because we've the online marketplace has trained them to do that. And especially like YouTube and TikTok and things like that, where they want short, quick, get the answer, but we don't want them to squirrel, so to say, and go off to a, another pathway. So just keeping the blinders on our potential buyers by keeping those landing pages crisp and clean, direct to the point. I love how you said that meeting their pain point um, and then taking them on that journey. Is there, and this is a technical question, is there a way to add more than one landing page to our website to drive it in? How do we do that? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, whether you're using WordPress, Wix or any of that, any of those CMSs, it's Mm -hmm. as simple as duplicating the landing page, right? And so you're talking about actually building multiple landing pages, right? I'm thinking, yes. If, if we want to have a landing page that's directed to each pain point, uh, would you recommend having those? And then I guess they redirect or how oh, to the website, that, is that what you're referring to? Yes. So that, that's a great point. So let's take the mm-hmm. example of um, social media. Okay. If I'm, if I'm doing an ad on Instagram or Facebook or anywhere, mm-hmm. and within that ad, I will have a link, let's say, learn more or click here or download the ebook or whatever it is. Yes. Within that offer, that specific ad that I'm running, and it could be organic too. Let's say it's just a post. Uh I I can within there add one call to action that links to one landing page Mm -hmm. that talks about that particular pain point and then link to another landing page 
that highlights another pain point. It's okay. almost like when you write a blog, you know, when you write a blog, you should on, I mean, really guidelines and standards are different for every marketer ever, every SEO. But for me, what has always worked is to have a minimum of three internal links okay. and three external links Okay. on my blog. So right. if you read one of the blogs that on, on our website, you're going to notice that on average, it has three internal and three external links. Okay. The hard thing is finding external links because link building is tough work. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of outreach to other websites that have high domain authority. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, with the dadpreneur podcast and the dadpreneur.co website, uh -huh. I don't have a lot of backlinks right now because we just launched that website late last year. Mm -hmm. So my only focus right now is to build that store, if you will, right? The website, right. I want to build as much content that is quality as I can. And when I run ads, then I wanted to go to different landing pages, um, offer landing pages, not my blog. Okay. I don't, I don't ever want to run an ad and run into a blog because people just don't read as much. Yeah. Um, but I, I will share a poll that I did on LinkedIn this okay. uh, past week with, with your audience. And the poll was this, I, I ran a poll first using Google surveys mm -hmm. and, and for any of you that are selling products and services and you're scratching your head about a particular question and you're going, boy, I wish I had the budget to run a focus group, which can cost you thousands, right? Sure. Google surveys is a great option. So you go to surveys.google.com and that lives within the Google marketing platform. Okay. And you can run surveys. Th these are paid. So they're mm -hmm. paid per result for as little as five cents per respondent. So in my case, okay. I ran a, a survey of 1200 people across the U S okay. and I picked certain sp specific like demographics mm -hmm. and psychographics, like the interests. Right. And it was around the topic of podcasts. Okay. Okay. And what I wanted to know was I understand Buzzsprout, Podbean, Apple, Spotify, they all have their own numbers. How podcasts is like, the you know forget right. it like the biggest gold rush and right while i agree with that i still think it's minuscule compared to youtube or compared mm -hmm. to other mediums on the internet okay so but what i really wanted to know the, the the question i wanted to ask was why are people not adopting podcasts at the rate that these companies are saying they are because when i talk to most people family members customers friends, neighbors, the majority are not listening to podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my wife is a perfect example. She's an avid reader. I'm a reader too, mm -hmm. but I, I split my time between YouTube, between reading and between podcasts. Me too. So I enjoy all information like you. Yeah. I'm an information junkie. Right. But for my wife, she's not, she's like, look, I like reading my novels and, and that's it. I don't enjoy podcasts. Mm -hmm. So when she runs on the treadmill or does the bike, she puts on music, Spotify. Me, when I run, I put on podcasts. Right too, yeah. I'm with now, you. If, I'm, if I'm having a down day, then I'll put on some like Drake or, you yeah. know, some, some old school hip hop or right. EDM or something to get me going. <laughs> but for the most part, I'm listening to podcasts. Yeah. But yeah. my question, Michelle, was like, why is there a disconnect between what the online world says and what is happening? So I did the survey on Google surveys. I believe it ended up costing about $120. Not to, bad. to run. Yep. Not bad. And of the 1200 respondents across the U S and mostly the audience I chose was 45 to mm -hmm. 65 years old. Okay. Right. And, um, it was around the topic of business, entrepreneurship and whatnot. I was surprised 65% of the people that responded as 65.5% mm -hmm. said that they do not listen to podcasts mm -hmm. on a regular basis or wow. ever. Wow. So I'm like, oh my God. Okay, hold on a second. Okay. Let me see if this is true. So I went to LinkedIn, which by the way, for those small businesses who depend on LinkedIn to connect with people and, and get their brand out there, one great tool that, that I've been using since last year on, YouTube, on LinkedIn is LinkedIn polls. Okay. LinkedIn polls, it's like if you, if you do a LinkedIn uh, post mm -hmm. or an article um, or a video, you get decent views depending. It all depends on your audience, of course, sure. of how many people you're connected with. But when you do a poll, yeah. in my experience and my clients' experiences that we manage their LinkedIn uh, pages, mm -hmm. the polls get three, four times no the engagement. I didn't know that. What a yeah. great tip. 
And now don't do the polls using your company page. So okay. that's the trick. People okay. on LinkedIn are wanting to connect with people. Okay. So I could take my company page, do the same post with the same uh, poll, mm -hmm. and, and it gets like single digit percentage yeah. of what I do when I do it personally. Interesting. So okay. I did the, but what I did, Michelle, is I did the same poll that I did using Google surveys, different audience. And I'm thinking, this is LinkedIn. A lot of the people I'm connected with are entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. they're marketers, they're podcasters. I did. Yeah. I bet it's going to be like the opposite. It wasn't the opposite. Really? Um, I checked yesterday. The poll's been going on for a week. Mm -hmm. And I think it's somewhere around 55% of the respondents. And I had hundreds of respondents. Wow. Um, over 50% responded saying they never listened to podcasts. Not only that, I had comments in the post of people saying, I don't know what the big deal is with podcasts. I'm a reader. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. So, Proof is in the pudding. You know, I'm not a marketer that just says things because I read it on a, on a blog or here or there. I like to test Smart. because so much information online is not always accurate. You have to filter. Yeah. You, you have to do your own research. And mm -hmm. I think the polls are, and surveys are a great way for small businesses to say, if I'm trying to penetrate this market, mm -hmm. what is actually happening there? Another tool that your, your uh, uh, audience might want to look at is the census tool. Okay. Okay. And the new census just came out. Most businesses have heard about it. The population in the U S has grown to over 330 million Wow. at the, it, it grew at a rate of seven 7.5% over the last 10 years. So all the data is there, right. but why am I talking about this census data for you? Because as, as a business owner and as a marketer, I can't trust that Facebook and Google and Amazon and eBay and all these other tech companies are going to be the, the, my, my first and last stop when it comes to deciding on my audience yeah. and on the numbers, right? Because they, they only cover a segment of the population sure. to, to begin with. Right. Secondly, we know, we all know that on all these platforms, sometimes you have one person with 15, 20 accounts mm -hmm. like Twitter, someone could have a million followers and 60% of them be bots. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then, you know, they're bots because you're going to their profiles. And again, you do your due diligence. So mm -hmm. the census doesn't lie. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't lie. The census is, you know, it's enacted by Congress. I mean, it's mm -hmm. been, you know, hundreds of years since they've been doing it and the data there, there's a tool, which I'll share with you later, Please. the link so that you could share with your listeners, but you. the tool is super interactive. Okay. And let's say you wanted to penetrate a, a, a Orlando, the market of Orlando, right? I can put in Orlando, the zip codes, as many zip codes as you want. Mm -hmm. I can, I can do it by toggling on the map, like a certain radius. Right. And then I can start to find out about the different categories I'm in. So let's say I'm a, I'm a restaurant. Mm-hmm. I, the tool will tell me from data that the census collected from not only people, but right. also businesses, how much on average the consumer in that zip code spends on clothing, on restaurants, wow. on cars. I mean, the fact that the tool is free right. should blow your mind. And, and, and yes, all the Facebook audience tools, the Google tools are great, mm -hmm. but it doesn't cover all 330 million plus Americans man the that's census awesome. tool does that i would have never thought of that i didn't know it went into such depth that was shared for free with the public so thank you that is valuable information so how how do you then turn that information and benefit your business for you what are you looking that, at that's a really great question because matching that data with the platform that you're working on the channel that you're working on the two plus taking your own database, what you know to be true, right? So I can tell you, you know, hey, Michelle, your target audience is this and your product is that. And then I go and do the research on, on the, the census website mm -hmm. and on the different uh, platforms like Google, Amazon, and sure. eBay. So I take those two pieces of data and I'll say, okay, based on that data, Michelle, this is what you should do. But the truth is, the first thing that you should be looking at measuring if you are not a new business, if you're not a new business, you don't have enough activity. I yeah. get it. 
you're going to lean on these two sources first. But if you are a business who, who in your case, you've been on eBay for what, 15, 17 years, uh, something like that. 17. Yeah. Yeah. So you have enough data to, to prove whatever you're finding here on the census or on Google, Facebook, right. eBay, you have enough data that, that tells you the truth about your audience. Yeah. The, the only thing you don't really know is how, where, where are the additional people? Where are they going? Where are they buying my products? Mm -hmm. and, and those tools can help you, right? So I would always lean on first your own data, whether it's your Google analytics, web analytics, email insights, social media insights, your shopping carts, lean on your own data first, look at your own clients right? and then say, okay, I know that these are my, this is my audience. Sure. These are the personas. Now let me go to the census. And if I'm trying to cover Orlando because I'm a restaurant, mm -hmm. taking that data is going to tell me the truth, whether, whether there is a, uh, um, uh, a market viability for my product or service. So smart. That's and so then, smart. yeah. And then for the digital world now, because the census is telling you the, the data that exists, not only offline, but online too. Right. Right. Whereas if I use Facebook audience tool or Google ads, um, keyword planner, and I'm looking mm -hmm. for audiences, you know, so take, take Google ads, for example, yeah. it's a perfect example. I will look for a keyword. Let's say it was, um, dentist near me because mm -hmm. we work with medical practices and I'm looking for dental dentist near me. I can look at that in a specific market, let's say a 25 mile radius. Mm -hmm. Google comes, comes back and tells me, okay, that keyword is going to cost, let's say $5 cost per click. Mm -hmm. And the volume in that 25 mile radius is a thousand to 10,000. And you go, well, wait a minute. That's such a like big spread. Yeah. Is it a thousand or is it 10,000? Yeah, really. And, and the, the reality is that they don't really know mm. with, with hundred percent certainty. And why, why don't they know Michelle? Because the, the privacy and the ad blockers and yeah. all the different things that most of us have been using more and more because of data issues mm -hmm. has been taking the ability of these platforms away. Yep. Like the end of cookies is coming. Yeah. And I know everybody's freaking out. Don't freak out. I think it's a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal thing for yeah. consumers. I'm all about put the power in the consumer's hands and yeah. sorry, Google, sorry, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, you know, Apple, by the way, isn't any more innocent just because they decided to, you know, end IDFA mm -hmm. for app developers. You know, Apple created that in 2012 and Apple is the one who said, Hey, Facebook, Hey, app developers. Here's all of Michelle's data from everything she does on her iPhone. Right. So they profited off of that for nine years and now they want to be the good guys. N look, yeah. I have a love hate relationship with the, with the big tech companies mm -hmm. because while I think they're great for small businesses, oftentimes they do what's best for their shareholders. And yeah. you and I, as small business owners, we have to take advantage of that, but also know where, where, some of the manipulations don't yeah. benefit our end users. So again, you, you have to really do your homework and figure out, you know, how you can track. And so IDFA is one of those things that if you are running ads on Facebook today, mm -hmm. okay, one of the things you're going to want to do with that pixel and the pixel, remember, it's just a tracking mechanism, right? a little code from Facebook, that is put onto the header of your website, mm -hmm. then your website transfers the data from users on your website back to Facebook. And then you ask, well, why, why does Facebook want that data? Well, Facebook wants that data because then I can retarget those customers, right? Right. That's, that's what all ad retargeting is all about. Right. You're still going to be able to do that even with the privacy and, and, and all of that. So you, you want to make sure that you verify your website. If you're running ads on Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. you must go to your business manager and where you go to events manager and there's a pixel there, you right. have to verify your website. Smart. Okay. So you got to do that. Otherwise you're not going to be able to collect that data. So I'm all about connecting all the data pieces for mm -hmm. enhancing customer experience, but I'm not for spying on every action that my customers right. are doing because that's right. not good, right?
Right. And it gives the, your viewer, your customer a better experience too. If, if you know, if you have more of that information, you can help better serve them um, in that process as well. That's fantastic. I love the information that you've given us. So many things I've already uh, have a to-do list in my head that I need to go ahead and um, start taking action on to continue to build my business. So thank you, Alex. Is there some, um, some tips that you'd like to leave us with today, our audience, as they're looking at growing their business based on the information that you shared with us? Yeah. I mean, really it gets back to that own media idea, right? Your yeah. website and your email marketing. So start there. Yes. If I'm e-commerce and I have a Shopify or eBay or Amazon website, great work on there, but try to get people back to your website. Yeah. So make sure you work on your website, the content, educate people, do videos, do podcasts, do eBooks, do yeah. master classes, create as much content around your topic as you can and mm -hmm. host them on your website Smart. and then engage with your audience using email. So the thing I hear from a lot of small businesses like Alex, I myself don't like getting email messages and offers. Mm -hmm. So I hit unsubscribe or I hit spam. So I'm not going to go do that to my customer. And I mm -hmm. say, well, look, I'm telling you, cause I've been working in this space in the affiliate marketing space for over a decade. Email marketing is going to be in every, almost every situation in every industry, the lowest cost per acquisition. Mm. Yeah. Because the cost of running email, as you know, the email service providers are fairly cheap, you know, right. I mean, yeah. up to 2000 contacts is generally speaking free, mm -hmm. whether it's HubSpot, MailChimp, Constant Contact, any of them. Right. And when you get to that, you know, 2000 to 50,000 to 100,000, sure, you might pay 20 to 100, $200 per month. And of course, the more sophisticated the software, the more you pay, but sure. it's a small price to pay to create a communication channel that is frictionless. Yeah. And so if I have an email, if I have a database of 10,000 emails mm -hmm. that I have permission, they're opted in, I'm not talking right. about spamming and I'm not doing email today. Yeah. I am leaving money on the table. Big time. And I don't care if you have just a hundred emails, start your email campaign. One really cool tool that I, uh, I've been using for the podcast. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do a robust email campaign to my listeners. Yeah. Right. Cause I'm like, all I want to do is just educate them on ways to generate leads. So yeah. I'm like, is there a, a simple tool out there? And I found a tool called Revue. So it's, you go to getrevue.co. Okay. It's an email newsletter software that uh, Twitter purchased I, a mm -hmm. couple of years ago, maybe. Maybe it was last year. It's free, unlimited subscribers. So you could have 20, 30,000 subscribers and it's free. Nice. And it's very simple because the templates are drag and drop, uh -huh. create your text, you add your subject line, you choose the subscribers there. It's not as robust when it comes to segmenting. So mm -hmm. again, if you're going to be doing next level email marketing, you need like segmentation. Stuff. Is that what you're talking Cor about? Correct. Yeah. But even segmenting the different audiences based on location, based on product, based on open rate, right? Right. Can't really do that with that. But for people who are business owners who are not well-versed in email marketing and are saying, gosh, I'm sitting on 500 emails or a thousand emails and I'm not doing it. Yeah. That's a great start. Upload the subscriber list, mm -hmm. test it. You, what you're probably going to notice is that your first few emails, you might only get a five, 10% open rate mm -hmm. with a higher level of unsubscribes, which is okay. Right. As long as you had permission to email them. And then you're going to start to craft the next email messages a little bit different, mm -hmm. right? You're going to learn that 35% of emails are open based on subject line. Yeah. So you're going to test the subject line right? and you're going to test the body and don't make it like this long yeah. newsletter that no one is going to read. No. Make it entertaining. Like in your case, Michelle, right? I'm going to send an e email newsletter. Mm -hmm. Here's the new episode for my podcast. Here's my course on eBay, right. like visuals. Yeah. Use visuals, not just sales letters, right? Mm -hmm. Because we all get so much in our emails that it might just get lost in the mix. Like white noise. Yeah. But, but that communication channel of email between you and your customer, you'll start to notice that the, as you do it consistently for mm -hmm. three, six, nine, 12 months, you'll notice the open rates go up. And as you add more subscriber, you'll notice that the click-through rate, the links that you put into the email start right. to go up. 
which translates to clicks, leads, and sales of your product. Which is amazing. What I, we should have another show, have you on again. This was just fantastic information, Alex. Thank you so much. I know with um, my emails, I actually, um, I did a survey with our subscribers and just asked, you know, how often would you prefer to have emails from me? And I actually was pretty surprised. Um, they all said daily. And I'm like, well, I don't know if I want to do it daily, <laughs> but, uh, but you would think, yeah, because as, as consumers and we're getting emails, it sometimes does, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, okay. Some, some lists I'll sign up on. I'm like, okay, hold it back. That's too many. But um, it's uh, definitely, it's a um, untapped tool that I don't think a lot of businesses really know the power behind it. And like you said, make sure you own your own content. When you have your own email list and your website, um, those are definitely keys that we should focus on as online business owners. Alex, where can everyone find you if they'd like to learn more? I know I'm going to, I'm going to jump on your podcast as well and start listening to your episodes. Um, but where can they find you? Okay. I'm going to give them the, my address to my house okay. first. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't come to my front door. But if you do, we'll have a cup of coffee. I'm just okay, outside cool. of Orlando here in Melbourne. I like Florida. hazelnut creamer. No. <laughs> yeah. No, but you can find me on LinkedIn. I, I spend quite a bit of time. I say I log into LinkedIn daily around 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. for about 10 minutes and then at night for a few more minutes. So a couple of right. times a day. So LinkedIn, on, I'm on there. You can also email me, alex at dadpreneur.co. Um, and then, of course, the podcast. Yes. Um, it's on Spotify. It's on Apple. Just everywhere you find podcasts. And yeah, and it, you know, if anybody has any questions, they can always email me or, you know, meet with my team at predict predict is our agency. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for lead gen, like a robust campaign, I have a whole team there that can do that. Nice. And I'm always game to talk about digital marketing, lead gen and entrepreneurship. So it's a passion of mine. That's awesome. Thank you, Alex. And your website, could you say that address again too? Sure. It's dadpreneur. So like entrepreneur, but dadpreneur.co. Excellent. And I'll have links for that for our audience in the show notes as well. Um, so I just really appreciate your time for coming on the podcast and the wealth of information that you shared with us today. Uh, any last thing that you'd like to leave our audience before we close out today? Yeah, I would just like to say thank you to you, Michelle. I think people like yourself and many of the people in the podcasting community who are giving each other opportunities or a platform to go out and spread whatever it is their mission is, right? So my mission is to help businesses build sustainable lead generation and marketing strategies. Mm -hmm. You're giving me a platform and then you're connecting me to your listeners. Yeah. And I don't take that lightly. So I just really want to applaud you and all the podcasters out there, even though not everyone is listening to podcasts yet. Yes. They will eventually, they will eventually. And then of course you've got YouTube and other channels. So again, all of us in the entrepreneurship, like entrepreneurial community, I just love it because everyone is always helping each other. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. And at the end, it's your listeners, your users who are going to benefit from this as well. And the only last thing that I'll leave you with is that once we put this all together, you're going to have other great guests. And, and, and of course, you've had already many great guests. It's putting some of this into practice, guys. Yes. So even if it's one thing that you heard me say today, and let's say it was the census tool, mm -hmm. then, then write that down. Go to that link, try that tool and use it you're obviously not going to be able to take all this fire hose of content that I'm giving you. Mm -hmm. And probably you've tried some that didn't work and that's okay. I'm not telling you that everything will work, mm -hmm. but bringing it all together, what Michelle is here teaching you and giving you take at least one thing, test it, measure it, and then do it again. I love it. That's my heartbeat. I love it. Alex, you've been an absolute pleasure to have on the show. And for our online audience, I hope you guys have really, I know you've gotten a lot of value out of the show. If you'd like to learn more, there will be links, like I said, in the show note descriptions below. And thank you again so much for watching. This is Michelle with Paladin Global Markets Online Business Podcast with Alex Oliveira. You guys have a wonderful day. Take care.